Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brenda Chang and I'm the clinical pharmacist at the 80 Bond Health Centre and the 61 Queen Family Practice Clinic. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, over a month now actually, we gave the first town hall on the COVID-19 vaccines and at this time we'd like to give an update to the information about the COVID-19 vaccines um, because as you know there's a lot more information now. At the time of the first town hall there was only two available vaccines and we certainly have a lot more now. So today's information session is to share with you some updates of the information. Um, so I'll get started. Um, a quick outline of today's talk will be to review what are the current COVID-19 vaccines and just to give everyone some key highlights. Um, next, we'll outline the efficacy and safety of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and then we'll review who should and who should not receive the vaccines and then provide an update to some common questions that have come up. We will not be reviewing some of the old information that was first highlighted in the first town hall at this time. So feel free to review um, that uh, town hall information available to you on our website as well. So in terms of our current COVID-19 vaccines, the key highlights really include now are that we have four available vaccines um, to us in, in Canada. Um, four have been approved, although um, only three is, is available in terms of supply at this moment. And the first two, as a reminder, are the mRNA vaccines. We have the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccines. And these two are both mRNA vaccines. And the mRNA stands for messenger RNA. And it's a single-stranded RNA that that gives the coding for the coronavirus spike protein to be made. And that protein is very important for the virus to um, find our cells and attach it and enter our cells. So the mRNA is placed inside a lipid nanoparticle and that's how the vaccine uh, gets into our body. Next, we have the viral vector vaccines. So these are a slightly different type of vaccines. We have the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a two-dose vaccine, similar to the mRNA ones, which is a two-dose vaccine. And we have the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson one-dose vaccine. These are both viral vector vaccines, as previously mentioned. The genetic code for the coronavirus spike protein is carried by a safe and non-replicating virus to teach our body to recognize it. So the key is that these are not replicating vi um, uh, viral vectors. Um, they do not produce infection in us and they are not live vaccines. So what are the vaccines made of now that we have four and you may be wondering, are there really a lot of differences between the viral vector ones and the mRNA ones? So there are definitely some differences in terms of um, the components of the vaccines. So just a quick review, the uh, mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines. So the medical ingredient um, or the genetic code is an mRNA. Um, for the non-medical ingredients, as you can see here, for the mRNA vaccines, it's mostly con uh, con consists of lipids, including cholesterol and a component called polyethylene glycol. Um, and that uh, we highlight here because we think that that may potentially be allergenic or the, um, have the ability to cause allergies in some people. And then the rest of the ingredients are primarily salt, sugar, and water for injection. The Moderna vaccine also has some acid stabilizers and one chemical is called tromethamine. Um, and that, that chemical may potentially be allergenic as well. For the astro AstraZeneca um, and the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccines, the medical ingredient is the recombined um, virus vector, which we call adenovirus of the spike protein. And, and adenovirus is, um, is, is our common cold virus. And again, it's non-replicating. And then the other non-medical ingredients include emulsifiers to help dissolve the lipids so that the virus vector can get into our cells. And then we recognize um, the genetic material helped produce the, the spike protein so that we mobilize the cells from our immune system to build antibodies, et cetera. The rest of the chemicals are mainly stabilizers as well, like acid stabilizers, some alcohol, salts, sugar, and water for injection. So as you can see from the, the ingredients that are within the vaccines, there are no pork derived materials, there are no eggs, no gelatin, no latex or preservatives. So in terms of efficacy and safety of the vaccines, um, I'll do a quick review and update some of the information that was provided at the first town hall. 
So again, as a reminder to everyone, um, it is important to understand what vaccine efficacy means. And so I'm going to just quickly review again, you know, if we're looking at what vaccine efficacy means, we are really comparing people who've received the vaccine to a, a group of people who have not received the vaccine. As is, And you can see here, a vaccine efficacy of 80% really means that if we took um, five people and vaccinated them and then compare them to another five people who've not received the vaccine, four out of the five who received vaccine would be protected from getting um, illness or getting sick. So that's what that means. And so certainly um, that's important because, you know, the higher the efficacy obviously means the higher the protection uh, for someone. And in terms of what we now know about the efficacy data from all of the vaccines, um, I'm going to highlight some of the key points to really show you what it means, because you may hear in the media different numbers and may be confused in terms of what that means. So for the studies that uh, uh, were originally done for all of these vaccines, they looked at people getting symptomatic COVID-19 disease and the efficacy for the Pfizer Moderna vaccine about seven days or 14 days after receiving the second so the full um, vaccine series was about 94 to 95%. So definitely very good efficacy in that regard for symptomatic disease. For the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's about 60 to 70% roughly um, after receiving the second dose, roughly about two weeks afterwards. But we do know with the AstraZeneca vaccine um, that that efficacy increases if the second dose is given even longer than this study period time of about roughly roughly four weeks time. So um, beyond 12 weeks time, the efficacy is about 82%. We also now have more recent data coming out from the US trial. So the original AstraZeneca trial was not done um, in the US, it was mostly in the UK and in Brazil as well. So the data that we're seeing now from the US trial, including those over the age of 65, is really showing us that the efficacy is about 80% or 79%. So for symptomatic disease, also very good. But really the key highlight is that um, for all four of the vaccines, they really do prevent severe disease. And what we mean by severe disease is the um, uh, patients who present with needing to be hospitalized or even death. So severe disease, all four vaccines have excellent efficacy and the reported efficacy is somewhere between 75 to 100%. And for the AstraZeneca one, the new US data also shows it's 100% efficacy. So we do know that they are excellent in terms of preventing severe disease. In terms of efficacy after a first dose, we also do have this data. Um, it's not applicable to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine just because it is only a one dose vaccine, but for for the three other vaccines that we have, we know that after one dose, about two weeks after um, just the first dose, the mRNA vaccines is about a 92% efficacy. And for the AstraZeneca, it is about a 71% efficacy after about 22 days, 21 days, so about three weeks after. So we know that even after one dose, we get really good protection um, from the, the vaccines themselves. So what does it mean in the real world? Um, so for the first town hall, I did highlight some information also from the real world. And, and we took the case of Israel as an example because um, in Israel, many vaccines have already been given and we, we were seeing some good data as a result of what happened after giving most of the population there the vaccine. And so just a quick review, what we know from the real world um, data and not just in a clinical trial setting is that after we started vaccinating people, we really saw that new positive cases cases started to decline there, um, and particularly in the older individuals. We also saw some declines in moderate and severe hospitalizations, which really points to the fact that the vaccines are helpful for preventing severe disease, and that's really important. Um, what I'm adding here is that we now also have additional data really to look at death due to COVID-19. And you can see in this graph over here on this side um, that based on real world data of more than a million individuals, the estimated effectiveness in preventing death from COVID-19 was about 72% with the Pfizer vaccine. So really, really important that we, we, we look at this, this data because the vaccines do prevent death and we have real world data to show that now. 
So how do the vaccines compare to other vaccines? Um, this is just to really highlight compared to the other vaccines that we have currently, um, including like polio, our MMR vaccines, the mRNA vaccines are really up there with some of the very highly effective vaccines. But the AstraZeneca vaccine, you know, based on the cumulative data of all we've talked about roughly around 70 to about 80% um, vaccine efficacy, it is up there as well. You know, we highlight here also the flu influenza or flu vaccine being 44%. I would say this is a little bit low, but this is an average of different um, seasons. Every year it is a little bit different. And we do know that the flu vaccine varies somewhere between about 40 to 60% efficacy. So the coronavirus um, vaccines that we have are highly effective based on this information. And again, overall effectiveness really depends on how many people get, S get vaccinated. And it has been estimated that we need about 40 to 90% vaccination um, of our population to really achieve herd immunity. So this is just a diagram to show you that, um, you know, the blue person here is the vaccinated person. And if we have more people vaccinated, even if there is uh, someone who is infected in the community, the spread is, is not that quick if we have lots of people that are vaccinated. So for example, here, the bottom graph, you see three people vaccinated spread um, from or transmission of the disease is much lower because majority of the people are already protected. So the virus has nowhere to go, nowhere to replicate. Um, and the way viruses work is that they do need a host in order to reproduce themselves and spread. So if most people are vaccinated and protected, um, it is very hard for them to spread. And really to highlight whether there are side effects, and certainly there are, as with other vaccines, side effects can occur. Um, side effects are observed in the clinical trials to be mostly mild to moderate and did not pose a health, health risk. And most did occur within the first few days, one to three days. For the mRNA vaccine, side effects were more frequent after the second dose and were more frequent in the younger population between 18 to 64. For the viral vector vaccine, side effects were less frequent went after the second dose. So here's sort of a, a summary of all of the different um, um, uh, side effects that were reported. And as you can see here, I've highlighted for everyone that locally pain is probably uh, the, the most commonly observed side effect, pain at the injection site, and that occurs for all four vaccines. Um, and then systemically, which are side effects that occur you know, throughout our body, headache, fatigue, and muscle pain are the most common. As you can see here, for the AstraZeneca, Johnson, and Johnson vaccine, they occur as well, but maybe to um, just a slightly smaller degree than the mRNA vaccines. But certainly these are all side effects that can occur um, very commonly with the vaccines. More importantly, though, is, you know, sometimes we focus a lot on side effects and we're worried about the side effects, but um, reports to Health Canada around the adverse effects really show us that we have not noted any safety signals. So you can see here, um, at this time, Health Canada reports no safety signals, and this data was updated as of March 26. Um, in terms of all of the doses that we've given, which at the bottom um, right corner, you'll see we have given close to 5 million doses. You know, this, the number of uh, serious adverse effects is, is 384. So that is, is in terms of a percentage, about 0.008% of all doses administered. So really, really small amount of serious adverse effects reported based on the number of doses that have been given. So that's just to highlight for you that while we do see side effects, the common ones are mild, non-significant, and they go away. And so, you know, as with other vaccines, um, this does occur, but it is not a serious uh, concern for most people. So in terms of who should and who should not get the vaccine, um, I'm just going to quickly review. This information hasn't really changed very much, but I'll highlight some information for the new vaccines as well. So as you can see here, the authorized age group is listed for all the four vaccines, um, primarily uh, above 18 years of age, with the exception of the Pfizer vaccine, which is over 16 years of age. Um, the bottom part of this chart really shows you that the original study participants included these types of people or individuals. And so the age range is quite broad for all the studies, as you can see, somewhere between 16 or 18 all the way into um, the 80s 
80s, 90s, and 100 years of age. Um, there was a good proportion of people who were in the older age group. The AstraZeneca vaccines originally didn't include very many people in the older age group. So you can see here um, that it was about 7% in the UK study and 3% in the Brazil study, but they have um, gone on to do the US study and that study did include 20%. Um, lots of people of different diversity were included in all three studies, as you can see here, including the AstraZeneca one in the US trial. And then again, lots of people with different high risk conditions were also included in all three studies. And what the high risk conditions include are things like lung disease, cardiac disease, hypertension, diabetes, and body mass index over 30, as well as HIV. So the studies did include a wide variety of different um, participants. Um, at, at this time of um, the clinical trials. So in terms of who should not get the vaccine, there are really only two reasons why you should not receive the COVID-19 vaccines. And they are one, if you're not in the authorized age group, and two, if you have previously had a severe or immediate allergic reaction to any of the ingredient to any of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and so earlier I, I was pointing out some of the um, components of the vaccine, highlighting which uh, components we think may be potentially allergenic for some people. And the two main ones are the polyethylene glycol call and the polysorbate. Um, note that those with a history of allergies are not more likely to experience an allergic reaction to the vaccine. And we are offering a waiting period of 30 minutes to those with a history of severe allergies. So even if you have like, let's say a peanut allergy or a shellfish allergy, you are not more likely to get an allergic reaction to any of the vaccines and you should safely, you should be able to safely receive the vaccine. As a precautionary measure, we do advise people who are acutely ill to defer vaccination, one, because we don't know if you're ill because of the COVID-19 um, or some other reason. Um, and then we also advise people who've recently had a different vaccine to wait 14 days before you receive the COVID-19 vaccine. And in terms of special populations, such as pregnancy, breastfeed, uh, breastfeeding, children and adolescents, and those with autoimmune conditions or who are immunosuppressed either because of medications or disease, none of the guidelines have currently changed. We are saying that for the pregnancy, breastfeeding, and the autoimmune condition and immunosuppressed condition um, that you may receive vaccine. You, in some conditions, you may need to have a verbal consent um, before you may receive the vaccine, but all of the experts are advising that you may receive the vaccine. For children at this time, um, like I said, the, uh, the vaccines are authorized for above the age of 16. Um, however, the the Pfizer vaccine can be used in those who are 12 to 15 years of age, depending on the condition. So if they're high risk for um, getting disease or if they are in a living condition that puts them at risk. We do know now that there is a lot more data coming out for these spe special populations, particularly in the pregnant um, and pre breastfeeding um, cohort, um, as well as in children. So we are hearing some data that Pfizer vaccine has excellent data for children. Right now, we're just waiting for more of this data to come out and to be shared. And as that happens, um, the vaccine guidelines will change and hopefully we'll be able to hear more. So an update to the common questions that have come up um, since the last town hall that we gave are, are the following. And just a quick review, the last time we did give a, um, a presentation that included answers to some of these questions, and I'm not going to review these in detail, but just as a reminder, what we said last time was that um, the vaccines were not rushed in any development. Um, the vaccines do not merge with DNA, and this goes the same for the viral vector vaccines. They will not merge with our DNA. Um, there are no dangerous ingredients to any of the vaccines, including the viral vector ones. You cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine because none of them actually have um, live co coronavirus in them. Um, uh, can you still get COVID-19 after the, the vaccine? And the answer is yes, but very low risk based on the efficacy data that we're showing you. And then if you've already had COVID-19, you should still get the vaccine because we don't know how long the protection is from a natural infection that you, you have. Um, so we want you to be protected. You do still need to wear a mask um, after vaccination because at this time, the public health guidelines haven't changed. We haven't um, had enough people vaccinated at this time to make sure that everyone is well protected. So those public health measures remain the same. The vaccines do not cause Bell's palsy um, and the vaccines do not affect fertility. 
So in terms of new questions that have come up, I think the most talked about one is whether the AstraZeneca vaccine causes blood clots. Um, and the answer um, is, is really that there were some reports in Europe that was coming out around a specific rare, very rare type of blood clotting condition called vaccine-induced prothrombotic thrombocytopenia, or we call it VIPIT. Um, and this is a very rare specific type of blood clot that's related to an autoimmune response and has been associated with low platelets and seems to occur more frequently in younger women. Um, we actually have not seen any cases in Canada despite over 300,000 doses that we've given of the AstraZeneca vaccine. So our National Advisory Committee on Immunizations is being um, cautious and have made a recommendation to pause the use in those under 55 years of age um, due to the safety signals that were occurring in Europe. Um, the vaccine itself is actually not associated with any increased risk in the overall risk of blood clots and experts in thrombosis strongly recommend the vaccine for those who have either had a previous blood clot or who are on blood thinners. So definitely no increased risk there. And just to point out some incidences, you know, in the general population, blood clotting risk occurs in about one in 2000 people, and that risk increases as you get older. For the case of VIPIT, the estimated incidence is somewhere from one in maybe about 100 to 125,000 to one in a million. So the cases are very rare, and worldwide today, there's been about maybe about 40 cases so far. So definitely a very rare condition um, and, and not something that we would typically see. And again, as a reminder, we haven't seen any cases in Canada, and we've given over 300,000 doses of this vaccine. The next question that, that has come up is, um, why are we delaying the second dose to four months and how do we know the vaccine will still be effective? And so a lot of factors go into this decision, um, but in an effort to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible, cities and countries around the world are making a decision to extend the interval between doses. Um, we do have good evidence to suggest that the vaccines are highly effective against symptomatic and severe COVID-19, even after just the first dose, like what I've highlighted before. And that includes the older population. And over time, that, that efficacy may wane a bit, but keep in mind that you are still protected to some degree compared to someone who's not received any vaccine at all. So someone never getting a vaccine dose at all is at 0% efficacy, right? So therefore, the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations feel that um, a rapid vaccination with a first dose will have the greatest benefit for all because then we can protect as many people as possible, limit the, the ability to um, spread the disease, um, and then and try to protect as many people that way. So this decision is being reviewed and, and recommendations may change. And so at this time, while some people may have their second dose booked for four months later, that may change. So we will wait to see what the, the guidelines um, say and what the experts on our immunization um, committee tell us. But that's the reason. You know, another question that's come up, and we did address this last time as well, although there was only two vaccines, but now that we have four, we should look at it again, is whether one vaccine is better than another. Um, and so to point out again, we've actually never compared the vaccines against each other. They were always um, in a trial compared to placebo um, or someone who didn't get the vaccine or got a placebo dose of a vaccine. So we don't have information to really compare them. But we do know that all of the currently available ones are highly effective for severe disease, like I mentioned before, in terms of preventing hospitalizations and death. So that is really the key is that they're all highly effective and all any one of them um, can do can do the job that we're that we want them to do. Um, and do the vaccines prevent transmission of the virus? So um, I talked a bit about this the last town hall as well, but we are starting to see some emerging information about how the vaccines can prevent transmission, um, which is a good sign. So original studies uh, for all of four of the vaccines mainly looked at infections with symptoms or severe infection, and they didn't really um, look at people who had asymptomatic um, disease. Um, but we are seeing some data that that the transmission may also be uh, prevented or there's less transmission with the use of the vaccine. So this is really important. Um, however, uh, someone who is vaccinated may still possibly get asymptomatic disease or become infected without showing any symptoms and transmit the disease unknowingly. So at this time, since 
the vaccines are not completely 100% effective. We advise everyone to still follow all public health guidelines for social distancing, masking, frequent hand washing until we really know more and until more people are vaccinated. Um, and will these vaccines work on the new variants? So certainly you'll hear now a lot more in the media about variants of concern. Um, and in Ontario, we are seeing a lot of the UK variant. Um, and, and so the variants are really um, viruses that have developed mutations, um, either that make them easier to transmit and pass on the disease, or easier to evade um, the ability of our vaccines to work. But so far, there is no evidence that shows the vaccines will not work at all for the variants. And the available data suggests that the vaccines have good protection against the UK variant. However, early evidence indicates that the vaccines are not as good as at protecting us against the South African variant because the amount of neutralizing antibodies produced may be less. Um, so researchers are now updating their vaccines, looking at maybe producing a booster dose to improve the immunity. So we need to stay tuned to, uh, until we know more. But at this time, definitely the efficacy for the UK variant is about the same as the original um, coronavirus. Um, and lastly, there has been some um, you know, social media um, um, concerns around whether there are microchips in the vaccine. So the answer is no, there are no microchips in any of the vaccines. This type of technology doesn't exist. Um, and this is primarily based on a conspiracy theory based on some preliminary research supported by the Gates Foundation for a technology that could store someone's vaccine record in a special ink, kind of like a tattoo, administered at the same time as the vaccine. Um, and just a reminder, Health Canada requires a detailed list of all components and their origins prior to approval of any vaccine. So you can be assured that there are no, no things in there that shouldn't be in there, including microchips. So in summary, um, all evidence at this time suggests that the benefits of vaccination far outweigh the risks. Making sure you get vaccinated helps to protect you and those around you against COVID-19 and the new variants. But vaccination is only one way for us to combat this pandemic. Please continue to follow all public health measures and guidelines at this time, even if you have received both doses of your vaccine. And if you would like more information, please go to our website at the St. Michael's Family Health Team um, found the practice website. Thank you for watching.